In his study of science fiction, New Maps of Health, Kingsley Amos declared that the genre deserved to be treated as more than Tom Fool's sensationalism and that it was a humanizing rather than a brutalizing force. In 1960, when science fiction was still mostly associated with B-movies and pulp periodicals, this was an audacious claim indeed. Almost 60 years on, the Science Museum of which I am a trustee is planning a definitive exhibition of science fiction and its influence for 2020. Film critics are swooning, quite rightly, over Dennis Villeneuve's stunning Blade Runner 2049, the long-awaited sequel to Ridley Scott's original. Meanwhile, you may have noticed both mainstream and social media devoting more attention to the new trailer for Star Wars The Last Jedi than is usually reserved for the actual release of most big-budget movies. At the time of writing, the two-and-a-half-minute clip had already been downloaded more than 17 million times on YouTube and dissected in prost in detail by fanatics of the cinematic saga. Historians of the genre raise a laconic eyebrow and insist that our fixation with science fiction is nothing new. How else, after all, to categorize Plato's references to Atlantis and the Critias and the Timaeus there are those who see the Tempest, exiled genius tinkering with the forces of nature and hidden knowledge, as the forerunner of a thousand mad professor movies, all of which may be so. But that does not explain the persistence of science fiction, especially on the silver screen, and its undiminished force in popular culture. One might expect a society experiencing technological transformation on an unprecedented scale to seek respite in other forms of entertainment. But the opposite seems to be true. Blade Runner 2049 trailer like its predecessor, Blade Runner 2049 explores the twilight marchlands that separate human from android or replicant, borrowing the conventions of the noir detective tale to give the film its narrative structure. This time, it is Ryan Gosling's K on the trail of Descartes, Harrison Ford's character from the original. To say more about the plot would be grossly unfair to those who have not yet seen the film. Don't be deterred by reports of its initially modest U.S. box office takings. Blade Runner itself, now recognized as one of the greatest science fiction movies of all time, was a flop when it opened. The capacity of science to engineer life, or something like it, has nagged at the human consciousness since Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Fritz Lang's Metropolis 1927 is indelibly associated with the image of the Maschinenmensch Maria, the gynoid artificial women engineered by the scientist Rod Wang. In 1939, Isaac Asimov seized the baton in the robot series, addressing the potential laws of robotics and their likely impact upon human civilization. What has changed is the context in which this fictional debate is carried out. When the first Blade Runner was released in 1982, the notion of androids barely distinguishable from humans was artistically intriguing rather than alarmingly topical. The final speech of the most powerful replicant, Roy Batty played by Rutger Hauer, all those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain, was unforgettable precisely because it was so hard to imagine a robot capable of such poetry. More than three decades later, machines can compose music indistinguishable from Bach. Artificial intelligence software can write restaurant reviews, produce apparently authentic art and compose cyber poems that are becoming harder and harder to distinguish from the real thing. The sudden surge of automation threatens billions of jobs. Blade Runner 2049 describes a dystopian world that no longer seems so very remote. It is only as far from our own society as today's smartphone is from the first handheld mobiles. Like Spike Jonze's Her 2013 and Alex Garland's Sublime Ex Machina 2014, Villeneuve's film is a canvas upon which we project all our fears about our prospective redundancy as humans, and deepening fear that the soul may just be another algorithm. More than ever, we use these imagined worlds as mirrors in which to see ourselves Matthew Dancona in contrast, ISNT Star Wars simply a cinematic opiate, an annual carnival of dazzling special effects and escapist space opera well, yes. You don't need to be an expert on the Turing test or the novels of Philip K. Dick to appreciate the swashbuckling thrills of the saga that George Lucas created and Disney bought for $4 billion. No franchise in movie history has permeated mainstream culture so thoroughly, or with such astonishing financial success. Yet it is a mistake to dismiss this success as simply the spoils of fanboy hysteria. If the Blade Runner films epitomize the capacity of science fiction to express our deepest anxieties, Star Wars enshrines an Olus ancient longing for myth, Star Wars The Last Jedi trailer indeed, the first movie, confusingly, episode 4 in the saga, was strongly influenced by Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces and its taxonomy of universal stories. For all its technological wizardry, textural density and growing cast of characters, the Star Wars series is reducible to a number of very simple themes the Manichaean struggle of good and evil between and within people, the relationship between generations and the possibility of a universal order enshrined in the Force. 
The grip of the films upon the global imagination would weaken were this unashamedly straightforward focus to be lost. The decline of religion, at least in the West, has not diminished our longing to pose such questions. In a poem on science fiction, Amos wrote what makes us rove that starlit corridor may be the impulse to meet face to face our vis and folly shaped into a thing, and so at last ourselves. And this remains the heart of the matter. More than ever, we use these imagined worlds as mirrors in which to see ourselves.